Lake Huron, halfway between Saginaw Bay and the north end of the lake is Thunder Bay. A little divot in the shoreline, six miles long, six miles wide, basically. That's a little divot for the Great Lakes. It's half of Mallet's Bay for us, more than Mallet's Bay. This is the upper corner of Thunder Bay, and in Thunder Bay, there's a population of lake trout that reproduce in there, but a lot of habitat has been destroyed by anthropogenic problems with industry, etc. So we were tasked about six years ago to remediating its habitat by building artificial reefs. Give them some more spawning habitat. Let's get lake trout reproducing more uh, in, in Thunder Bay. Because as far as we knew, the natural habitat had been basically destroyed. So it's a little difficult to see on this shot, and I will give you a close-up in a moment, but there are two come through here, there are two series of artificial reefs. We've built 29 artificial reefs, each one of them 75 feet long, 30 feet wide, and either five or 10 foot high, in two arrays or two lines of reefs. The red dots you're seeing there are receivers. So this is a close packed series of acoustic telemetry receivers that allow us to triangulate exact positions of fish. They don't just say, oh, I saw fish 53 passing through, they say, I saw 50, fish 53, it was right there then. And again, we can do that for three years, watching these fish <coughs> pinging every three minutes for months on end. So what you're looking at is the bathymetry. The destroyed reefs are those big red areas. The little red dots are our, are our receivers, and those little things you can barely see are our artificial reefs. So then we're going to focus in on that a little closer and say, where are we hearing the fish? And what you're going to see each dot represents a position, a detection of one fish, because I'll do one fish at a time, at a moment in time. And we're looking for six weeks just over the spawning season. If we looked at everything, it would get a little bit too thick. <coughs> so this is fish, our, the first fish, this is fish number 518. He's a male, he's a wild fish, not actually reproduced. You can see more clearly now without the, the, the clutter, those two lines of artificial reefs, and he's completely ignoring them. He's focusing all of his time on a fairly small patch of substrate up to the, uh, to the northeast there. It's like, okay, be like that. All right, let's look at another one. Oh, okay, well, he's completely ignoring our reefs completely. He's in the same place the other male was, but spreading out a little bit. Again, this is just six weeks of activity, but this is the focus, the spawning activity. Let's look at another fish. Oh, completely ignoring our reefs. And point is, they're all showing up at the same place. This is something we could never have told with any other kind of technology. We can't sit in the water identifying fish physically. Gill netting wouldn't tell us where they're going. It would only tell us where we caught them. This tells us exactly what they like and where they want to be and where they're spending their time. So, of course, we follow this up and say, well, if they're going to be there instead of our reefs, what is it that's so cool about there that isn't on our reefs? And we discovered that, in fact, there is an artificial, excuse me, there's a natural reef out there we had no idea was present. There's been bathymetry down in the bay, but not fine-scale bathymetry. And so we found these huge aggregations of uh, boulders and, and cobbles that represent really fine spawning material. And in fact, we then did the fine-scale bathymetry. This is a map of this area where the lake trout are hanging out that we discovered because of telemetry. And if we superimpose on it those pings, now we're going very fine-scale. This is about, translation, 250, uh, 500 feet by 500 feet. Boom. The fish exactly match what the bathymetry is. They like piles of rocks to spawn on. We know that. That's what they want to do. They hide their eggs in the rocks. That's 2012, 2013. Same idea. They know exactly what they're doing. Of course they do. Now, if I had another half hour, what I would go into greater detail about, but I can give you the brief summary, is that those data were from 2012. 2013, we started having fish showing up on the artificial reefs. A week ago, I got the data from 2014. It takes quite a while, these are megabytes of data. It takes a while to, to filter the data so you can read them. But a week ago, I got the third year of data, and they've started to move over to our reefs. Every fish is using every reef, or at least exploring every reef, and there are actually less fish now on the natural reefs. They're spreading out. Instead of having just one concentration of fish spawning, we've got a diversity of spawning sites, which means we've got more chances that more eggs will survive and we'll get more successful reproduction. So we're really hopeful both that the, uh, that the idea of constructing reefs would work, 
but also that these data are really informative about what fish are doing in terms of preferring spawning sites. So that brings us back to Katos. Where have we got to at this point? We're in our second year of data right now. The first year we'd already, when we tagged the fish, the second year, that is to say last fall, we're beginning to see where they're going. Um, and what we're finding is answers to several questions. First, fish tend to like one site. Both males and females will explore multiple sites around the lake, but then as the spawning season progresses, they settle down, they fix themselves on one site, and they stay there. Somewhere between 60 and 80% of their time is spent at a single spawning site. So clearly they pick one site for that year and go, yep, yeah, that's, 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 my, that's my place. That's what I'm going to do. What we'll find out this year in the fall is, is that the same site for each fish year after year? Is there, in fact, spawning site fidelity? And a given fish always comes back to the same spot. The third thing we're finding out is, although we have receivers uh, detection capability at each of the spawning sites that I know from previous studies from from diving and from egg captures from a variety of studies are good spawning sites some of them are showing up in places let me rephrase it some of them aren't showing up at all that is to say they're not at any of the receivers on our known spawning sites which obviously means there are other places that are hanging out in the fall that we're not looking at we have yet to discover which is exciting. It means that the spawning areas in Lake Champlain are indeed scattered far and wide throughout the lake. It's not just the nine to ten sites that we know of that are up and down the lake. So if they will lead us to other places that we can study, we trust. The other thing briefly that we're doing, we're spending a great deal of time um, perfecting the technology, learning how this technology works. It's all new and we're all now, who are working on it, contributing to what is the range of the detections of this technology? What's the probability we would miss a fish if it came within the radius of our, of our receivers, for example? Winters have been really kind to us these last two years. It might have been a little rough if you didn't like winter, but we're working on the lake throughout the year. The ice is spectacular. So we've been going on long hikes down the lake, um, setting acoustic receivers and setting uh, uh, test tags to see what the, the reception of these receivers is um, at various ranges from the, uh, from the telemetry. So, um, this is my crew, you know, they've been having a good time. If any of you recognize this, it's the Apple Tree, uh, the Apple Tree Bay uh, um, uh, buoy. And uh, a slightly different, we'd never do this during the summer. It wouldn't work quite so well. Um, that's where we are right now. I'll certainly be happy to answer questions. Um, there's, there's probably a little time to do that. Before I finish, however, um, on a very different tack, I know some of you have Cisco for me. Um, Bill's been informing you guys about uh, Cisco. Cisco is a whole new venture for us. Um, there's very little known, well, the state knows quite a bit about Cisco, but from a research standpoint, the basic population genetics, uh, um, the, the morphology, the, excuse me, the morphometrics of, the, of this species, you know, what's the age structure, what are the basic population dynamics, um, we don't know a great deal about. They're hard to catch because they're suspended and we don't know where the concentrations of them are. You guys are catching them. And any time you bring me one, it's great. We, we love those samples. It really helps us get ahead, get a head start on this project. So for all of you who brought them, thank you. If any of you who are still catching them and have, are, are able to freeze them down and give them to us at some point at a meeting like this, thank you. You can always drop them off at the lab or email me, and I could either pick them up or, or find a place to drop them off. Thank you. I'm going to quote from, uh, from Douglas Adams by ending my talk. Um, so long and, and, and thanks for all the fish. That help is tremendously appreciated. Alvin? Or, uh, I got a question? Yes. Um, now that we have alwines in Lake Champlain, um, with the thymoin deficiency, like I was just on the Salmon River in Alaska yesterday, and they're having a huge problem with big die off. Um, do we see what can we do here with that? So the thiamine issue, and I think most of you know about the. Can you hear me with that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. My, my professor voice, right? Um, with the thiamine issue, we've been monitoring that now since 2005. Both salmon and lake trout thiamine has gone steadily downwards, more severely in salmon than in lake trout. Um, in the hatchery. They can accommodate that by, by, by treating the eggs with thymine, not a problem. Uh, it does affect the adults, and we're seeing, as you say, in the Salmon River, this possibility that the adults themselves are not making up the thymine in their diet 
enough to uh, offset the famine they're losing from, from eating alewife. And so that's the next big problem, I think. Lake trout, which I'm studying more, more uh, uh, you know, that's my, that's my focus of study. We think that the wild problem may not be as bad as, as people have imagined. Very few people have studied the effect of the thiamine in, in the eggs in the wild eggs. I mean, they study them at the hatchery because that's where you see it, but you don't go out in the wild and look down and see them with thiamine deficiency. We have been doing that. Um, we're getting very large numbers of fry still being produced from the reefs. Now, you could say maybe those are just the fry that didn't have low thiamine, the, the random few eggs, but we're not seeing a decrease in the production of fry. And what we're working on is the hypothesis that these little guys feed much earlier than they would be fed in the hatchery. You can't feed them early in the hatchery, they won't take dead food. But they're feeding within about two weeks of hatching, and they're just chowing down. And there's a lot of thiamine in that food. So we're right at the point in the lab now, we've raised some, some uh, uh, different treatments of, of fry to see does that early feeding make up the thiamine they need to allow them to survive. And we're optimistic that it does, but I'll tell you in about three months whether that works, because we need the laboratory analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Have you come up with a way on the fish that you're tagging for your telemetry for us to recognize them so we're not taking them out of the room? Thank you for saying that. Um, our fish, any fish that has a tag, these tags are expensive, the, 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 the technology is expensive. The tags are a couple hundred dollars. Right. So we have, and thank you, put a Floyd tag, that same tag that, that Andrew was talking about, on the outside. It gives our telephone number, uh, it gives our website, that's our website. Um, and so you know it's a Cassos fish, it's a tag fish. So if you get the fish and you see that tag and the fish is in good shape, release it, please. If the fish is not in good shape, it looks like it's going to die or it's already died, or you picked it out of the freezer and went, oh, whoops, we found one when you went and filleted it, um, we'd still love that tag back. It's still got life in it, and of course we'll get the information that that tag is no longer in our receiver array. So again, you can contact me if you already know my number. Bill knows where I am. Thorny knows where I am. I'm at the university, but that's also our website. How do you and distinguish that tag over the regular one they're using? Because it says UVM and it has a different phone number. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Is right. it also so yellow as well, or is it a different? It's green. It's green. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, is there anything we can do as sportsmen here that would help? I know these tags cost a certain amount as far as raising money to uh, buy more tags. Is that something? More money for more tags is always wonderful, but each one is so expensive. You know, they're, they're, I said 200 I said a couple hundred. It's $300 per tag. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if there is opportunity for... You know, uh, to start a study, you know, for example, tagging salmon, um, you, know, you, you want to work with Fish and Wildlife Service, absolutely raising money to, pr to, to get more equipment would be fantastic. Cool. Yeah. But that, uh, uh, that's our lab website, the Rubenstein Ecosystem Science Lab. And as I say, CATOS is linked to that and all the information about it. So if you want to learn more, that's what it is. Is there any advantage to having, or would there be any advantage for you to have receivers on, like charter boats on the lake? That's a great question. There are mobile receivers. Um, one of the problems is you can't do both at once. You don't hear a great deal while the boat's in motion because of the cavitation and the noise from the boat itself. So you can listen, go someplace, listen again, go someplace, listen again. Um, there is potential for that. Again, the mobile receiver is quite expensive. The state's going to be getting one, but um, as we get up to speed using that mobile receiver, that could end up being a really exciting possibility. If we say, essentially lend a mobile receiver to a, to, a, to a charter boat or fishing boat and say, just, just tell us what you find. They're not automated yet, so you couldn't just leave it there collecting data. Somebody would have to be sitting there writing down the numbers that they've found. And, yeah, it takes a lot of your charter time now. But thank you for the suggestion. You have one of the receivers in Wayland Bay on shore? We have one in Wayland Bay, yes. Any other places where anglers might be sensitive to it? Yes, uh, and... It's a floating one, and you can see it. It should be underwater by now. I hope it's not in the ice. Right. So, so, and I, I'll apologize in advance. I, I know there was a bit of... We're learning as we go along. There's a bit of angst about a couple of our receivers, and I can maybe go back to this. There it is. And then it's a little dark. Um, we have them on either side of the breaks, the, 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 the break on the, in Sandbar, and on either side of the, of the break in the uh, Island Line Causeway. Now, we started with those with surface buoys so we could find them. Well, naturally, people zipping out of those sort of said, hey, that's in our way. 
Sorry, you dropped it. We, we took off the surface buoy and we sunk them so they're now sufficiently underwater that you will never encounter them and you won't get in your way. Fine. We learned that lesson and we will keep doing that. During the summer, many of the others do have surface buoys, but they're all the ones that hopefully are out of people's way. They won't impede your passage. If you see one, they're big, uh, um, um, you saw them in the previous slide, they're big, yellow, round, uh, hard buoys. Um, if you see one and you feel like it is <coughs> troublesome, let me know. But by and large, I think we've taken all the ones out that would, would interfere with navigation, for example. Otherwise, just leave them alone. Hunting. Believe me, you won't be able to pull them up if you hook it. <laughs> how, deep, how deep of water are those in, like off the causeway there? Off the causeway, they're only, uh, translate, they're only in 20 to 40 feet. Right, so they're quite shallow. But yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll snag your gear and take it with them, so uh, don't, don't try fishing around. <coughs> Blame it on a branch. <laughs> no, big fish exactly. broke it off. Big fish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One that got away. Right. Cool. Yes? Did you find any answer regarding the fact that once the lake trout is found, the little baby lake trout disappear? We're getting there. We're getting there. We don't. So, so the, the same study in which we're feeding fry to see if they can make up their thiamine is reassuring us that starvation is not the issue. So the, the, the three reasons why fry might die after they emerge would be they either starve, there's some sort of disease we have not yet recognized, or they're eaten. We've looked at predation. <coughs> I, not enough predation to disappear every one of the fry from every one of the reefs in every year. I, I don't think that's a good, a good hypothesis. Disease, frankly, the state and the pathologists have a good handle on fish diseases in this lake and other lakes. Um, starvation still worries us. You know, is it possible something has changed? The fry are eating, their bellies are full, and they're eating very early and, and continuously. So now we're thinking about looking at the diets of them after they leave the spawning reefs and they head off to deep water. The trouble is it's very hard to study the diet of something you can't find. You can't find them. I mean, that's, that's the problem. They disappear at that stage. We have that issue, too. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. so we're gonna, again, we're going to bring it back to the laboratory. One of the, the, the ideas, you know, the, the ideas start to get wilder and wilder, but um, mysis, the opossum shrimp that, that is throughout the deep portion of the lake, is a very abundant and very fit, rich food resource for every lake trout in the Great Lakes, where they are very, very abundant. They used to be very abundant in Lake Champlain. In the 1990s, their population numbers plummeted. And we don't know why. Probably, maybe, dry cenids, you know, zebra mussels, uh, as an influence. But we do know their numbers are now about 20% of what they were uh, in the 70s. Now, it's possible, then, that, the, that these little lake trout, as they're heading down, are not finding sufficient mysis as food. We don't even know, actually, at what life stage of mysis the lake trout can eat them. So we'll start with laboratory experiments and move outward from there. But that's, that's our, basically our next smoking gun, if you will. And I hear lake trout are slow growing. Yes. It's the average, the average fisherman, could they tell how old the fisherman, a fish is that they caught, say a 10-pounder? Is there? Yeah, good question. Within a given body of water, yes. So, so here's the thing. As you probably know, fish grow according to their food supply. They don't have a, you know, if, you, you can tell a 15-year-old human roughly, like, can be about yay high sort of thing. There are populations of lake trout, say, in Great Bear Lake and Great Slave Lake, that eat only plankton. And a 25-year-old lake trout will be that big. 25? 25, right. I mean, they don't grow any bigger, because they're eating plankton. Right. In that same lake, a different population of lake, population of lake trout eating fish, a fish this big will be five years old. Right. So that's how variable it can be, and that's why it's so challenging. Within Lake Champlain, though, I think we know that they're eating smelt, we know they're eating alewife. So, you know, you can start to approximate how big a fish is at a given age. And Brian Chipman has actually growth curves of, you know, take a fish that's five years old, it's going to be from about that big to, you know, size range. It's going to be about from that big to about that big. A 10-year-old lake trout can be about that big to that big, and so forth. So he could pin it down with data much better. But you can approximate from looking at yeah, it. Up, up to about five to six or seven years, it's fairly predictable on the size range. But once they get up in that 30-inch, 10-pound, 12-pound class, they could be anywhere from 8 years old to 18 years old. Which puts a whole different meaning on the word trophy. You might get yeah. some you know, normal-sized lake trout, maybe. But it could be a 20-year-old, and that would be a trophy in this lake, just in terms of 
age and the fact that it's lived that long would be, would be awesome. It's a pity we can't query them more easily. Um, scales don't do a good job on, on the other yeah. huh. to age them. There was a... Uh, why all the lake trout stock have fin cliffs, not only so we know they're hatchery fish and not wild fish, when we look, look when, we're, when we see an unmarked fish out in the spawning population, we kind of get excited. Oh, this might be a wild fish. That survived, you know. Um, but also, they're, they're clipped on a five-year rotation. One, one, one particular fin every five years. So we can kind of narrow down uh, the age, at least with the smaller, smaller lake trout by, by the, uh, by the fin clip. So you're saying up to about five, five or six years old. Wild fish? Not necessarily, because there, there's, there's a small error rate of, of marking fish in the hatchery, one to two percent, that might escape a fin clip, and that's about all that we've been seeing is, is within that percentage of unslipped fish in our sample. So we're not really seeing anything going greater than the fin, the fin clipping error rate to suggest to say maybe we are having some some wild fish. I, I think there are a smattering of them. You know, that Ellen's found a few. We, we found a few last year, and the exciting thing there was these were what we call young of year. They were post fry, but not yet to that first winter. And they were smaller than the size at which they are stocked. And no fin clips. Thank you. Okay, you, you're wild. Um, and we found two of those absolutely, and two more that could have been. So, and that's more than we find most years. And frankly, you know, there's a lot of things, uh, uh, water pollution uh, included, that require a certain amount of patience. And certainly what happened in some of the Great Lakes where we're now seeing restored populations is it's not clear if anything absolute happened so much as it simply took way longer than we expected for the natural reproduction to take off and become established. And so the fact that we're starting, you know, just, just a few, it may have been a fluke year, it could easily be a fluke year, it could have been just a good sample, or it could be the beginning of something really positive. I'd like to think the last well, how, you know, how, For example, you worked on Lake Ontario. How long did it take from first lake trout stockings until wild production was found in Lake Ontario? They started stocking in the 60s, and we started finding fry and, and recruitment in the 90s. Right. Wow. See, that's, we, we couldn't be on the same trajectory here having started in the 70s. Yeah, absolutely yeah. we could, and that would be great. Mm. I wish I could then could take you know some credit for it. <laughs> Brian could. But, no, you just stand back and watch, and they do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a 39-pound lake trout caught off the Niagara Bar 10 or 12, 15 years ago, and they estimated that fish was 10 years old. Yeah. Go ale life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.